Welcome to the Good Push Toolkit for Social Skate Projects on Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning, also known as MEL. So just to give you an overview on what this video will cover, um, we'll look at what is MEL and why it matters, as well as some related topics, specifically accountability and ethics. Then we'll cover a couple common tools that are used in MEL that can be useful for you, so surveys and uh, also something called the most significant change story. Then we'll briefly talk about how to communicate with donors about your MEL. And then we'll listen to a story from Skatistan in South Africa where educated Daniel will talk about his own experience um, getting to know MEL for the first time. So what kinds of things will we go over then? Uh, what will you learn, hopefully, in the next 20 or so minutes? Um, firstly, uh, hopefully you'll learn a little bit about how to make your programs a better experience. So um, yeah, collecting information that you can then use to improve the work that you're doing. Uh, secondly, um, with, through MEL, you'll be better positioned if you start to do more of this to tell people, including donors, supporters, the communities you work with, about how the work that you're doing is making a difference. And also in this presentation, you'll see some examples of MEL methods, as I said. So before we start, just a question to get you guys thinking. Um, what are some examples of MEL that you know? So if you already have a escape project going are there some things that you're already doing that you think might qualify as MEL so this could be things like taking attendance or doing a head count um, it could be even just having a group discussion like maybe you're doing a skate class and then at the end of it you have a, a little bit of a debrief um, it could be just weekly meetings amongst the volunteers that you have. There's lots of different ones, and we're going to talk about more examples later. So, what's MEL? Well, as you can see, it's actually three different parts, um, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. So, monitoring is basically the, the checking and documenting that you're doing uh, so that you can know if your programs are happening the way that you've planned for them to happen. So when I gave some examples just before, there's what are called um, quantitative monitoring, which is numbers-based. So that's things like attendance, um, headcounts, uh, and surveys when you're asking questions to get percentages and averages. Then there's uh, what is known as qualitative monitoring or narrative based so that's you know doing interviews um, videos photos uh, focus group discussions so it's more open-ended type of stuff then uh, the second term here is evaluation so this is the kind of assessing and interpreting that you're doing to figure out if actually what you're doing is good quality if the kids are having fun and learning if you're reaching those goals so you're you're kind of analyzing that data and information that you're collecting and um, you can then kind of put this evaluation into things like annual reports or donor reports or maybe just some uh, you know blog posts that you put up about what you've been doing lately then the third term learning so yeah, I mean, it is, what <laughs> it is what it sounds like. It's basically taking that information and your analysis and then learning from it. So figuring out how you can use the information that you've collected to do your work better. Um, and yeah, you might uh, just work it into the, the planning process. You might change up your activities if, if you hear back from the kids that they thought that a certain class that you provided was super boring then you probably want to change that. So something else that I think is important when we're talking about NEL is accountability. And this means basically doing what you say that you're going to do. And there's three different groups that I think um, skate projects are generally trying to be accountable to. So, I mean, firstly, and probably most importantly, is the, the participants that you're working with and the community that you're working with. You want to really be doing what you say that you're doing, that, that they're expecting from you. Um, secondly, and this is maybe um, 
a group that a lot of us don't think about so much, um, but we should be accountable to our own organization. So um, not only if you're a formal one that has a board, yes, of course, you have to be accountable to a board, but also to our staff. So our staff are committed, they're, they're putting in their work and they're, you know, expecting um, maybe at a certain level of support, they're expecting the organization to basically follow through on what it says that it will do. So yeah, that's being accountable to the organization itself. And thirdly, there's accountability to donors, which actually a lot of times MEL is kind of fueled by donors requesting this kind of information. They want to know that when they give you money, you're actually doing what you say you're going to do, which makes sense. Um, However, it's important that MEL is not only driven by donors. I would say that Skatistan's own experience, uh, coming from being like a very small grassroots project to now uh, quite a, a, a large international organization, was that our MEL, MEL activities really increased gradually over time. So at first, uh, we were doing um, various activities, but we maybe didn't know the terminology. We weren't maybe consciously thinking of it in like a kind of structured strategic way but over time we kind of built up quite a, a strong MEL uh, system and in the in the early years this was really actually driven a lot by by donors so um, we would be you know putting in a proposal or an application and there would be certain requirements you'd have to be doing you know uh, like surveys a certain amount per year and you'd have to um, put together what's called a, a logical framework and we had to figure out, okay, what is this? But now increasingly we are proactive in our MEL uh, because we have the capacity to do so. But um, something that you will find when you get into the MEL stuff is that it can be time consuming and you have to really think about what makes sense with your, with your resources that you have on hand. It can be very overwhelming. There's always more to do and learn, but the best thing is just to get started. So why does MEL matter? Well, the basics of it are here, quality, proof, and money. That's really narrowing it down. It's like such a huge topic, but uh, quality wise, you want to be providing the best possible programs and MEL will help you to do that. Secondly, it gives you proof. You can actually prove that your activities are effective, that they're doing whatever you say that they're doing. If, if, if you want to um, increase confidence among young people through a skateboarding program, you can actually measure that and, and show others that it's happening. Um, thirdly, MEL can be very helpful in terms of getting funding for your projects. So a lot of skateboarding projects are nonprofits, they're charities, and they rely on donations from people, from foundations, from governments to do the work that they're doing. And yeah, with good MEL processes and systems, you can really, you know, get a lot of support behind the work that you're doing and also meet donor expectations when they're saying that they need certain things done. I think that the term MEL self can come off as very technical and boring, so people tend to avoid it, but actually, Everyone in your team should care about it because it's something that will help the entire organization. So whether you're someone who's out there teaching the classes every day, whether you're uh, someone who has to take care of, um, you know, getting the funding in and um, doing social media updates, whatever you're doing, it will be useful for you. Something that, that's cool when you're actually in the process of doing MEL is um, that you can start to identify trends that are going on in your project. So these can be positive trends, they can be negative trends. Um, maybe you're seeing an increase in participation of girls and that's really cool. And you can maybe dig deep and find out what's, what's happening there. Um, or the opposite, maybe you're seeing a real drop off in girls' participation and then you can say, okay, what's going on? And we need to make changes here. Um, and I think MEL can also really um, prompt kind of reflection within your project, within your team, and it can help everyone that's involved feel more connected and involved uh, when they're seeing the impact um, in a way that can be communicated easily with others. Like it's one thing to see an impact with your own eyes. That's obviously the best, but not everyone can do that. So that's where MEL can come in. So what makes a strong MEL system? 
This image here, it doesn't really matter if you kind of read it all right now. You can do that later. But the, what I like about it is that it shows that MEL, a good MEL system, is actually like a cycle that continues. It's not a one-off activity that you do, you know, once a year just to like meet some kind of uh, expectations from others. It's something that if you're doing it well, it's ongoing. You're you're putting in the plan of what you're going to do. You're You're doing those activities. You're assessing them figure out what you can learn from them, and then you're going through this process again. So something that's definitely important to talk about in terms of MEL is ethics. So this is following uh, a kind of set of a commonly agreed upon standards on what's right when you're doing uh, data and information collection from the people that you're serving. So some examples to consider for your social skate project are to ensure that you're always in, um, considering the well-being of the participants that you're working with, especially if these are children. You have to be extra careful that you're thinking of what is in their best interest and not just, you know, your organization or the donor or whatever. So this could be, you know, not asking very sensitive questions that might upset the the participants. As an example, uh, another another thing to think about is informed consent. So. This means that anyone that you're collecting information from knows the reasons that you're collecting this and if it is a child that actually their parents has, have given that consent ideally, parents or guardians. Um, another thing to think about when doing MEL is uh, ensuring privacy and confidentiality. So if you're doing a survey, you may want to conduct those in kind of uh, uh, private places or at least where the the participant the child can answer without others overhearing because maybe that will make them feel uncomfortable or affect their answers or um, yeah different different things and also that once you have that information collected that you are not sharing it with the na full names attached you can also um, save that information securely and uh, you know a password protected area and yeah lastly to do your MEL activities with integrity so obviously don't make up information don't kind of uh, influence the answers that are given um, a big one is to actually do these activities or like for example survey make sure that they are translated into the local language to make sure that the people you're talking to clearly understand what's being asked. So the first kind of, or one of the most popular examples of MEL, and probably one you've come across lots of different times, is surveys. So at Skatistan, the, the common surveys that we're using are student surveys. So these are happening at least once a year, and we're asking you know all kinds of questions on the experience that students have been having and um, trying to yeah get information on on what they're actually getting out of our programs and you'll see actually an example on the top right there uh, from a past skaters done survey and it, this I believe actually relates to confidence so seeing how kind of self-confident students are in themselves and um, yeah we're measuring these kinds of things over time then another common survey type that we're doing in Skatistan is um, educator surveys. So we will also ask questions to those that are teaching about how the different programs are running and which ones the students are, you know, really excited about and that kind of stuff. We also do surveys internally for things like after we do a, a staff training or um, if we're doing annual reviews of staff. So they can be really useful in lots of different ways. And when you're doing a survey, um, you probably will end up um, having a mix of closed and open questions. So closed questions are usually simpler. They're usually the ones that you're using to get numbers and trends and percentages and stuff like that. So an example might be just collecting the gender and nationality of a participant and then being able to give a breakdown uh, of the kind of more information about the background of your participants. Then open questions are trying to collect more details and insights from the students. So um, yeah, you can find out like a, a deeper impact. And this will, putting these two together is really good because you can see overall trends come from the closed questions, but from the open questions, you can actually 
maybe analyze and figure out why those things are happening. And if you're interested in doing a survey, if you haven't done one before, there's actually an example survey um, on this toolkit. If you go to the, the MEL page and scroll down to the bottom in the resources, you'll find it and you can feel free to adapt it and use it within your own project. So while surveys can be especially good for the kind of numbers-based data and getting a little bit more information through those open questions, um, sharing individual stories of the impact that you're having can also be very powerful. And one way that you can do this is called uh, most significant change. So the, the idea with most significant change stories is that you are looking back over a certain period of time and you're trying to pinpoint one story that kind of best shows the change that your project and the impact that it's having on your participants. So to give an example from Skatistan, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. So this is a, you know, rather than looking back over the last year, I'm going to look back over the last 10 years and tell you about Nurzai, who's down there in the photo doing the rock fakie. So Nurzai started out as a Skatistan student. He was one of the first Skatistan students when he was around 11 years old back in 2008 in Kabul, Afghanistan. And he joined the kind of outreach sessions we had at an old empty fountain. And at the time he was uh, working on the street, so shining shoes and things like this. And he just kept coming to Skatistan. And in 2009, when Skatistan opened the, the first skate school, he signed up as a student and kept coming and within a year or two he joined our youth leadership program as a volunteer and started to help teaching the skate classes and then yeah after you know doing really well there he got hired as a staff member and actually when he was only around 16 or 17 years old he was still in high school he was selected to actually lead our skateboarding programming when we opened a second facility in Afghanistan in the north. So he moved up there and continued his high school and was teaching part-time at Skatistan. He graduated high school and then while he continued to teach full-time at Skatistan at that point, he pursued a law degree, which he has now graduated from. So I think that's just kind of an amazing example of what can happen when you're working with uh, children over a long time period. And yeah, so I would encourage you maybe after watching this video to to look back and think what is the most significant change that you've seen in the life of one of your participants, uh, perhaps in the last year, perhaps since you've started out. And I mean, this exercise can be a really useful one to do with if you have a team with everyone thinking of their own example and then you all talking together about what your examples are. What's good about this exercise, most significant change, is that it doesn't require any special professional skills. It's not a technical thing. It's just it's just storytelling. And the the results that you get out of it will be really good things that you can share across your social media, um, on your website, and any reports that you do and are, are also really good for face-to-face -face meetings because as much as you can put out statistics about what you're doing, uh, it also helps to have these deeper stories about what's going on. Now, as we're getting closer to the end of the video here, uh, just a few notes about communicating with donors about your MEL. The first thing is just to be careful about what you promise. So uh, in our experience at Skatistan, it's best to um, under-promise and over-deliver rather than the opposite. You want to be able to carry out whatever you say that you will do. Um, another useful thing is to try to align all of your MEL activities across donors. So this means if you have two different foundations, for example, and you say that you'll do an annual survey, you don't tell one foundation you'll do it every June and another you'll do it every December because you're just going to be doubling up where if you're more organized, you can do the same survey and share it with both donors. Then uh, third point there is to set expectations early. So especially if you're a smaller grassroots organization, the reality is that you have very limited time and resources and uh, you have to communicate this with donors and they, they should understand that as well. And when you're looking for donors for your projects, um, be a bit uh, thoughtful about um, if, 
you know, the, what you're getting out of it is worth what, um, expectations there are on their end. So, um, good donors will recognize that, uh, you only have so much capacity and, you know, they won't give you a grant for a thousand dollars and expect you to be, you know, spending several hours every week on MEL. So it's a uh, good to think of like balancing these things. And in general, uh, businesses, so corporates and individuals will be less time consuming in terms of MEL reporting. Um, that's just, yeah, that's the reality. Um, yeah. So avoid energy draining offers if you can, of course, that is a luxury and sometimes you just have to take what you can get. Um, and then lastly, the important point here is if there are higher expectations on, you know, the MEL results that donors want, then ask them for a separate or additional budget to put towards building up your MEL capacity. And a lot of them will actually be very interested in helping you to build this up. So now we're going to hear um, from Daniel, uh, an educator at Skate Stand South Africa, about his experience learning MEL. My name is Lauren, and I'm the Monitoring and Evaluation Manager at Skate Stand based in Berlin. Okay, okay I'm, I'm Daniel, and I'm an educator at Skate Stand South Africa, and we're based here in Joburg. I've been working at Skate Stand for almost three years now. So um, can you tell us about the first time you learned about monitoring and evaluation and learning? Um, the first time I learned about monitoring and evaluation and learning was the time I started volunteering at Skate Stand. Because at the beginning, we didn't have a facility with the skate park and everything. So we used to do um, outreach. Yeah, like so that's the first time I actually um, I started doing MEL because we had to, like, take attendance of all the kids whenever we do the sessions and count how many girls we have and how many boys we've got. And yeah, like just also to report on on like what activity we we're doing with the kids. Um, but then um, when I learned properly about MEL, it's when um, we had training. It was back in 2017, we did a, a one-week training with us on monitoring and evaluation learning. And then that's when we um, like went into depth uh, about the ways of measuring progress within our program. What kind of things stood out for you in that week? Was there anything that was interesting that stood out in particular? The one thing that, um, that, 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 um, that stood out for me the most was um, all these different like measures um, we can you know we can use to to sort of like track our programs and you know be able to see the you know the, the effect and impact that we have within the kids. Nice. Talking about all the different methods and activities, what kind of MEL activities are you doing at Skate Stand South Africa or other staff members? What are they doing regularly at the skate school? Yeah, um, the main thing that we do um, I'd say it's observations um, and you know, it's not just me and everybody else, the other staff here, you know, it's something that we normally do. Um, and then the other thing that we also do um, is doing surveys as well as like focus groups and questionnaires. Do you have a favorite out of all those activities? <laughs> um, well, I'd, I'd say, I'd say, you know, focus group as well as case studies, you know, it's always, I like those because, you know, like sometimes a kid come at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, this kid can do like amazing stuff in the skate park and also in the classroom so you can hear and, and understand like, you know, um, how, how they, they, they grew within our programs. You know? So it's kind of nice. I like that one because you also see that the actual change that you're making in, in like that we're making into your kid's life. My last question for you is, how does monitoring, evaluation, and learning help Skate Stand to do better work? Uh, so, like, so what I like about it, 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 it gives us the, you know, the change. So we get the, you know, the, 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 the beginning phase where a kid comes and then, you know, you get to also see the end result. So, um, so usually sometimes um, 
things might not go as you had planned. You know, so sometimes you know, like by doing this MEL, you get to understand the the issues that you encountered and some of the things that you know you can work on. You know, some of the stuff that you can make better. Because, for example, um, sometimes when you do you know, like um, you do surveys or post focus group with the kids, you know, like sometimes you would ask them what is it that they they enjoyed, what is it that they didn't like within the programs, what is it that they would like to change, you know, um, how do they feel about us, you know, the educators or facilitators, you know, um, so like sometimes, you know, like the kids would even tell you like, you know, there were certain things that they were happy with, certain things that they were not happy with, so, um, so that alone it helps because we can now sort of like cater and change, you know, and make things better to cater for the kids. And also, it helps us uh, to be able to report to other people that you know are not part of our programs on a regular. You know, like someone, for instance, you know, a potential donor, you know, wouldn't necessarily see what we do here at Skate East End, You know, so doing MEL, um, it gives you know the third party is an idea of what happens, especially like on a daily basis with our programs. So as we wrap up this uh, MEL presentation from Good Push, uh, here's a few ideas on next steps you can do if after this presentation you feel motivated and like, you know, you want to take some steps forward in your project. So firstly, uh, if you don't know already, uh, identify what your so what factor is. So this means, you know, you, you're obviously clear on what activities you're doing every day. So maybe you have a loaner board system and the kids can come and you know use a park and or maybe you actually have um, teachers doing skate sessions maybe you're doing even broader educational programming so you're doing these things but so what what is it that you actually hope that your participants are getting out of it what is the impact that you're trying to have knowing this will help you to actually figure out how to get there and it will be essential for guiding your MEL activities as well a second helpful activity is to make a list of the MEL activities that you're already doing. So there's a checklist actually in the resources section of the toolkit at the very bottom. And once you know what activities you're doing, you can try maybe writing this into a short paragraph that you can provide to supporters or you can you know, put into a, a project proposal or something like that. And a third next step that you could take on is to choose one new MEL activity to start doing. So yeah, take a look at that checklist, see the different examples, uh, maybe some of the ones that we talked about today in the survey, uh, most significant change story. If you're more ambitious, you can delve into uh, logical frameworks or theory of change. Those are talked a bit about in the, the guide on this toolkit. Thanks for watching the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Toolkit on Good Push. You can find some handy templates and resources at the bottom of the toolkit page and feel free to use those within your project. And you can always get in touch if you have questions.